Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Prithvi Devre, um, Associate Regional Planner here at SCAG in the Mobility Planning and Goods Movement Department. Um, thank you so much for your interest in joining in. Apologies for the mix up on the Zoom link. Um, anyway, we are all here now, and I'm very um, excited to introduce the Curb Space Management Study um, and the toolbox that we developed as part of the study in this Toolbox Tuesday session. We also have Jessica Dislip and uh, Jacob Mallow from the Arcadis IBI group who will walk us through the to a curb space toolbox. Um, next, please. Uh, we have a packed agenda today um, and have some time at the end for questions. Uh, we'll uh, start with the, curb st um, the study overview and then we uh, have, like I said, Jessica and Jacob, they'll walk us through the toolbox of uh, IBI's uh, Curb IQ platform and um, case studies. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so it's a SCAG uh, curve space management study. It's a SCAG study with a team of consultants uh, bringing both local and global knowledge uh, and uh, field specific expertise. Um, I'm going to condense the study overview in the interest of time. Um, next slide, please. So the primary objective of the study was to provide various curb management strategies and recommendations for multiple cities within the SCAG region and develop a work plan for pilot project concepts. The tools developed in the process are intended to be used by local agencies across the region uh, to help understand their curb space related challenges better, as well as develop uh, customized work plans uh, and then leading to further efforts towards uh, pilot projects. Um, next slide, please. Okay. So thank you. Um, there were uh, two sets of participating cities that we had here. First group was um, uh, more involved in the focus of the study where uh, we did site selection and data collection, work plan development. Uh, these were Anaheim, uh, City of Riverside, Santa Ana, and Santa Monica. Uh, we also had a second group, uh, City of Los Angeles and Long Beach, and they were more involved in the overview of the study and peer exchange opportunities. Uh, along with that, we were also in touch with their respective county transportation authorities. Um, as we deep dive further into this, um, you'll see that the toolbox was developed with various components, including stakeholder engagement, site selection, data collection. Um, and um, I'll also add a link uh, to the Curve Space Management study page in the chat box. Uh, please feel free to look uh, into the final report. Um, uh, that goes much deeper into the methodology of how everything was developed. Um, next, please. Um, we are gonna, uh, going to launch a Zoom poll now to basically um, gauge interest and understanding so we can uh, run the presentation accordingly. Um, and uh, Jessica, now basically <laughs> you can take it over from here um, as the responses start to tickle in. Okay, thanks, Prithvi. Uh, so the poll is intended to primarily give us an understanding of what audience we have. So there's a number of curbside concepts and terminologies and whatnot. And the focus of today really is on the tools that were developed for your curb space management program. Uh, so this will give me an idea of which terms I should be defining to make sure that everyone who is in attendance can get the most out of the session. So I'll just give it a moment. It seems like we have a, a pretty good spread. Um, most people have at least heard of curbside management, um, but not everybody. It is a very hot topic, especially with uh, everything with COVID and the rise of e-commerce and such, excuse me. Um, so I'll end the poll there. It looks like we have a few very familiar people and a few not so much. Uh, so let me give a quick overview for those who are not as familiar and to clarify what we focused on in this study in terms of how we have defined curb space management. So what is curb space management? Uh, some may define it as addressing the shared transitional space between the roadway and the sidewalk. Others say it's more about managing the shared space. Uh, some people get a little more elaborate and define it as where movement meets access or even the nexus of transportation, land use, and economic development. 
So the curb space is the part of the roadway immediately adjacent to the sidewalk or the boulevard um, that most people associate with curbside parking. So if you go to park on the street, you're in the curb space. If you're in a bike lane or waiting for a bus at a transit stop, um, the bus and the bikes will be in the curbside lane. So curbside management seeks to inventory, optimize, allocate, and manage the curb space to maximize mobility, safety, and access for the wide variety of curb demands. Um, there is a number of curb space users. Everyone on this call is a curb space user at some point or another. It's just part of navigating through our space. And as everyone will know, it is a very contentious, very high demand space. So what we're looking to do with the study and the tools that we're going to discuss today is to say, how can you manage it? Um, and I know that some people uh, especially those who are a little more traditional in how their roadway is used may not think that curb space management is needed. Um, but what we're trying to bring as part of management, we're not saying that every city has to have a world class, progressive, innovative curb space management. Uh, you don't need to have every street a complete street. You don't need to have everything with the newest technology, even if the space should be used for um, on-street parking, whether it's free or paid. The point of curbside management is that you do need to manage it for as many or as few uses as you have. Um, and what we wanna do is make sure that the way it's being managed is appropriate for the local context. So what is in the toolbox that we are bringing today? Um, this is a, a high level overview that I'll go through, um, but you can see just from the descriptions that we have some more high level concepts, starting with our themes and best practice categories, and then we go through some more uh, specific details in our menu of options and our step by step guidance. And then there's also some supporting materials to help explain other concepts such as equity or partnerships. So starting with the curb space workflow, the graphic on the right is an overview of everything that was done as part of our curb space management study that we did with Skag. Again, as part of that study, there were four cities that were the focus cities for that study. Um, the method by which we approached it is we took a number of insights. So these can come from community and stakeholder engagement. It comes from literature review. It comes from other policy documents. There's, it's taking all of those pieces of information and slowly, slowly distilling it and categorizing it down until it's a manageable uh, size. So at every stage you are are uh, essentially evaluating the information so that by the time you've worked through this process, you end up at a pilot project work plan that you can be confident is aligned with your themes, the vision, the direction, um, and what the community wants for your city. Not everything within this approach is going to be applicable for everybody. Um, different wherever you are in your curb space management journey will dictate where you can jump in and the tools that we're bringing um, for people who want a more comprehensive plan then you can follow this in its entirety and it's a really good way to come up with the overall starting with the higher vision and then working your way down to a implementation plan for the short term long term um, whatever you need and for others, you may just have specific key issues within your uh, city that you need to address. And then you can jump in more um, halfway, for instance, where you already have your problem statement and you're looking for uh, a quick win solution. So that is the, uh, the kind of overview is this py reverse pyramid, starting with gathering your existing conditions data, systematically categorizing and consolidating it until you have manageable and logical recommendations. You will likely develop a pilot project work plan and the concept that is very important, but we have not necessarily fully covered and I'll get to that after, um, is that it doesn't end here. 
this is where we ended the, the study with the tools that we provided, but there is still work to be done when you monitor and evaluate the project. So at the top, the first thing that we did was categorize all of the insights into general themes and best practices. And these are, while we took it as input from the four focus cities, um, they are trends within the industry. And the best practices in particular are elements that every city and everyone that uses the roadway in this day and age has. So start with demand, uh, which is the amount of parking that would be used at a particular time, place, and price. You have policies, you have new changing uses in technology. Um, we've all seen how things like uh, bike share, micromobility, curbside uh, pickup and drop off, Uber and Lyft, um, all has a huge impact on our curbside use. Data and privacy, um, this is a big one as well. The more efficient you are at collecting data at the curb, the better your regulations and your management can be, but it comes with a trade-off. And that trade-off is um, how do you manage the, the privacy and the amount of data that you have? We also have, I'm not gonna go thoroughly in detail, um, as part of the toolbox, descriptions of what these themes and best practices are. So we have already done the work of gathering all of these insights and grouping them into these key themes. So this, um, there are tools available to describe what each of these elements are in more detail. Um, but just going through the rest of them, we have design, cost, agency resources is another big one, um, communications and stakeholder perceptions, because again, at the end of the day, this is for the community and safety as well. So all of these uh, certain pilot projects and problem statements will link with um, either just one or even a few. There's different elements within the study that need to be um, worked on in collaboration, um, but these are our high level themes and they are consistent for both the regional scale as well as the uh, individual cities. From our uh, menu of options, there's a bunch of different terms that you'll see in different studies. Menu of options is basically a very large list of potential projects. Uh, so we tried to, well, we did categorize it, again, going from our top down. So we start with themes and best practices. And from here, um, we have these categories. Um, I guess to rewind uh, just a smidge uh, to get us on the same page, apologies. The order by which you do the grouping doesn't really matter. And it's confusing to think of it in a linear fashion. Um, there's a number of different ways that the themes can be linked. Uh, so there's a lot of terms that I'm throwing at you with um, insights and themes and categories and problem statements, menu of options. Um, what we did for the study was we did all of that research and categorization for you so that when you get to your menu of options, it is grouped by category. There is a problem statement that was uh, similar across the cities that we interviewed. Um, there's the best practice area, so that's where the themes come back in, that policy, that demand. Um, and then within that, there are certain strategies. So for instance, the problem statement that shared uh, micromobility was tried but failed, the best practice area that it speaks to is policy and demand. Within that, there's a strategy for alternative micromobility permitting. And then within that overall strategy, there's more specific tactics one being a single vendor concession, another being a private property shared mobility. Um, there are, this menu of options is, is quite extensive. Um, and to avoid just having a list of all of these potential strategies and tactics, um, so transit pass parking rebates, real-time sensors, these are all, uh, when you hear about innovation and implementation and pilot projects at the curb, Generally, they're talking about things that are in this menu of options. So flex zones, uh, short-term parking pricing, graduated parking um, pricing structure. And then what we've done with this table 
is categorize it so that you're not starting with a tactic, you're starting with a problem statement. There's usually something is happening or not working at the curb and you're looking for a way to manage it. So you start with a problem statement and then from there you can kind of see, um, depending on where you are, some cities and it depends on the politics, it depends on the resources, uh, for instance, cost could be one that uh, there's just no funding or no resource for um, a study at this moment. So you might choose to go for a strategy that doesn't have cost as part of it. It only focuses on this policy and demand, which might be easier. Um, and then that will naturally lead you to this strategy of permitting. And then you have narrowed down the list of strategies that you want to investigate from, what is that? One, two, three, four, five to two. Uh, so it, it cuts down the work a bit. Um, so that is the, the menu of options. Um, and as I'm going through all of these tools, if anybody has any questions as I go, I'm, I'm happy to discuss um, as we go to, to clear it up while we're on it. Um, otherwise there is a Q and A at the end. <clears throat> So our menu of options gets us that uh, specific project that could be implemented. And then another one uh, tool that we have developed is our curbside typologies. <clears throat> so a typology, it's a buzzword that's been um, floating around the industry. A lot of people have heard of street types in the context of complete streets or even how your road network is uh, organized and described in uh, official plans. So curb typologies, um, also curbside and curb space are interchangeable. Um, whether you call it a curb space typology or a curbside typology, we're talking about the same area of the roadway. Uh, so a typology is intended to bridge the gap between high level policy documents and detailed design work. Um, it's meant to be a starting point in the design process, so more of a guiding principle, not an ironclad or rigid rule. What a typology is, is it gives you an aspirational vision for what you want your street to look like. And again, when we talk about streets, the curbside changes very frequently. Um, it can change on a block by block basis. It can change on a corridor by corridor basis. Um, the function is based on the adjacent land use. Uh, curb space is primarily a means of accessing and utilizing that adjacent land use, but we also recognize it's part of the overall our network road network system. So especially during peak hours, uh, you may not want that parking because you need the space as capacity for vehicle throughput, vehicle transit, cyclists, just movement. Uh, so the typology allows you to zoom out from the details of what's happening on that curb by curb, block by block basis. And it allows you to look at the street in the context of the official plan, other policy documents, uh, in the context of what the zoning and adjacent land use is. And again, it can change uh, by season, it can change by time of day or day of week. And looking at that area, what do you want that street to look like? Based on what you want that street to look like, you can identify a typology and that typology will help you interpret that aspirational vision into what function are you trying to prioritize and how does that function then lend itself to specific priority users and um, priority uh, pilot projects and designations. Um, so a typology is also intended to provide a common language to help decision makers, stakeholders, and the public alike better understand, A, the different ways that the curb space can be used, um, how the current curb space can be improved, and transparency. The big thing with curb state, uh, curbside management is that it is a very scarce resource. It is a very valuable resource. Everybody needs it. Everybody wants it it is physically constrained, not everybody can have the same access. 
that's not to mean that you have to prioritize one user over another. It's that you need to prioritize where each user is going to access the space. And typology can help with that transparency and visibility for when the, uh, for instance, you have a shop owner and they want to have on-street parking, but they also need to have loading zones and they also need to have maybe a curbside patio and they can't have everything. So having a typology allows them to understand the trade-offs and what the vision and the focus for their area is. And then if uh, concessions and compromise where maybe loading happens during an off-peak time or parking is around the corner, um, they can kind of see how the on-street designation aligns with that larger vision that they want for their community. So a typology, we started off by breaking it down into three categories. Um, specifically, we have mobility corridors. These are corridors that prioritize person throughput. So it could be vehicular throughput, uh, transit, uh, cyclist, what have you, um, but the focus is on moving people. And these corridors serve high volumes and typically restrict curbside use to reduce friction along the corridor. Friction being uh, the primary thing that slows down traffic and reduces capacity. The second is community corridors. In these corridors, um, the focus is on balancing safe curbside interactions with multimodal mobility for locals. So these are often in residential settings and it could have a focus on curbside deliveries, activation, green space, making it a safe and convenient place for people to enjoy their um, local setting. Um, the number of users in that area could be more restricted. Um, the density is often a little bit less, um, so the, the function changes. The third corridor or category is urban corridors. Urban corridors prioritize safe curbside interaction for people. This includes transit users, uh, TNC are your transportation network companies. So that includes your Ubers, your Lyft, your taxis, um, and Pudo, which is pick up and drop off. Um, it also has micro mobility. So those are for areas where there's a lot of different uses. You have a lot of different users and uh, very, small space. Within, um, depending on time, because I know we started a bit late and I don't want to um, belabor it, but there were nine, sorry, 10, I believe, uh, curbside typologies that were developed, uh, grouped within these three categories. Um, and if there's time at the end and questions, then I can go into them in more detail. Um, but for every single one, we have prioritized, they look like this, where there's a priority of a curb function. So the five functions that have been defined, and these are consistent with um, what other cities have done as well when looking at curbside use. Uh, you have access for people, placemaking, deliveries, parking, and movement. Within each typology, the function is ranked so you can look at uh, what you want uh, the corridor to look like based on land use. And then from there, you can see, uh, for instance, mixed use Main Street. So this is for a corridor that is the focal point of a downtown area, um, often includes a mix of uses. And once you've defined that, then the typology lets you know, okay, the pilot projects that we want should first and foremost prioritize access for people and lastly prioritize movement. So along this corridor, you can see from this typology that uh, peak period, or sorry, um, that parking and curbside space should not be restricted. Um, parking should be not the emphasis. So when you look at the percentage of curbside space and how it's allocated to different users, if you find that 40% of your curbside space along this mixed use main street is dedicated to parking, that could be an indicator of curbside space that could be redesignated to better fit the focus of the street. So some of that parking could be changed to uh, dedicated 
uh, curbside patios, for instance, or it could be a flex zone that could be used for pickup and drop off or deliveries, depending on the time of day. Um, so the function is what will allow you to take the vision, the corridor type being the vision, and then linking it through these functions to the pilot project, which is the more detailed design. And again, the typology uh, isn't a fixed thing. The way that you provide these functions can change based on city. You may have other corridors that are not defined in the 10 that we've defined as part of this project. Uh, the point is to give a starting point, give a framework, um, start off with 10 typologies and um, along a street, it can also change by uh, differing blocks. Um, a corridor doesn't have to be from like the entirety of the road. It's, the framework is meant to be flexible. Uh, so moving on, we have um, a work plan template as well. So once you have gone through, you have looked at your menu of options and you have identified the frame, uh, pilot project that you wish to proceed with, um, you need to develop a work plan to design, approve, implement it, and monitor it. Uh, so the work plan template has accompanying step-by-step -step guidance, and it's intended to provide any city within the Skag re uh, region with a tool that will take you from conception to completion. So there's step-by-step -step guidance and supplementary cut sheets, uh, which we call extended guidance, um, as well as a checklist. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to switch over just yet. If there's time at the end, I'll, I'll come back to it. Uh, but there's a series of Excels, and each one has um, a description of the different pilot phases. Just a moment. Maybe I will switch over just to give uh, a quick overview. Apologies, my computer is just... Okay, while I, I seem to have, oh, here we go. Okay, one moment. Okay, uh, you should be seeing an Excel, um, a Google Sheet. And at the bottom, you can see that there's a number of different uh, tabs and the different tabs are for different parts of your work plan. So you start off with a pilot profile. Um, there's what gets a little confusing is that there's different elements within the work plan. So your pilot profile, your feasibility, if you have any partnership developments, and then there's also phases to a pilot. Phases being the more chronological order that most people are more familiar with. So the phases of a pilot are conception, planning, launch, pilot, learn, report, and scale. Those are the five phases. Um, the phases do not necessarily happen in chronological order though, there are tasks that can overlap as you develop it. So within this tool, uh, which the phase of the pilot that um, the action aligns with is noted. And you can see that some align with two different phases. So for instance, the summary of the pilot is part of both conception and planning phases. Uh, within these uh, sheets, there's also guidance for each of the tasks. So it's, it's broken down where if you're not familiar with how to develop a work plan, you can come through this sheet, you can go stepwise through the various tabs and the various actions, see what needs to happen. So for instance, you need to know what the problem statement is. And here there is a description of what is meant by that. So identify what you were trying to test and how you know there needs to be an intervention. Um, moving on to other uh, elements. 
So these are kind of more themed. So for the engagement and outreach, you can see that this happens um, during the planning part of a pilot. Um, as you scroll down, most of these are planning. And again, for every action, so identify the council district in which it's located, develop a one pager. And again, there is guidance on what each of these tasks means. And it also serves as a checklist so that as you go, and especially if you are collaborating with other departments or um, just other team members, um, it serves as a tracker so that you can see where you are at any given time. Um, and then switching back. Okay, that should be the uh, slide again. Uh, and that was just a screenshot of what I switched over to. Um, so lastly, we also have uh, supporting materials. So we have these, uh, what we call extended guidance sheets and it's information to bring industry knowledge and subject matter um, expertise on equity privacy principles um, and local government best practices, as well as private sector partnership and engagement. Um, these are topics that are very important for curve space management when you get to the pilot project um, detailed design part. Um, understanding these, there's often a lot of questions. Um, so the sheets are intended to take a lot of information that's available online, information from um, our experience, as well as just best practices within the industry and distill it into a um, generally a, a two or three pager so that you can get a, a broad understanding of which concepts you may need to cover. So those are also uh, available. Um, and then I'm just gonna double check that Jacob is here. Jacob, if you're here, I don't know how to check uh, folks, but could you just pipe up for a sec if you don't mind? And it looks like Jacob might not be here yet. So I will keep going and just shoot him a quick message. Ah, he doesn't have the invite for this link. Sorry, give me one moment and uh, the other presenter um, just needs the link. Um, I'll email the link to him. Email. Okay, Sorry. thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, so on the data side, uh, data is very important um, and it is, sorry, give me one moment. Okay, so we have gone through a number of tools that are available for use. Um, and before you can use those tools though, before you can manage the curve, you have to understand the curve. And the level of detail of various data sets can differ between the steps that you take to make the most of available resources. So a lot of people will turn to data first when developing their curb space management program. And that's not necessarily the way to go. Uh, data is definitely very important. Um, having good data, being able, having the tools in place to understand and analyze the data is very important, but it is not the only piece of information that you need. Uh, sorry, just give me one moment to close my door. Uh, dinner time for the dogs here. Uh, so for uh, on the data front, 
there's three different elements um, that you need. So there's an office review. This is where you can, when you're first starting out, if you don't know how you want to manage, if you don't have a specific problem area, and you just want to say what is the status of curb space management in our city, then you can look at your existing data sets. So looking at your parking regulations, your zoning designations, um, you can also look at, uh, so all of that goes into, for us, we used a parametric model, but it doesn't have to be as complicated as that. Um, if there's time at the end, we can go into that more. But basically, we have a map-based tool that allowed us to analyze those existing data sets and produce uh, hotspot areas where key factors that we cared about. Um, that's where the city staff input came in. Um, if you know that there's funding or whatnot and you want to prioritize uh, cycling infrastructure, or if you want to prioritize um, urban, like mixed use, dense downtown areas, um, then you could assign the weightings to see where those pockets are in the city. And it allows you to focus your efforts, um, especially in the beginning when trying to find those um, quick wins. The key element to see here is that data, the way that we think about it is one element and the other element is stakeholder input. So it's more of that, that soft information, if you will, it's that understanding of what are the key areas and focus areas of the city, um, what is happening in the industry that is worth trialing um, or if there's potential for partnerships with uh, third parties or academia all of those can work together to forming what your recommended strategies will be. Uh, and as part of our journey in understanding and using data, this is where I'm going to pass it to Jacob, who is now in the meeting, um, to tell you about a tool that um, we at Arcadis IBI have developed that we have used for this study to help us understand the, uh, the regulations at the curb. Uh, so, Jacob, I will pass it to you. Hello, Jacob. And just checking if he's having technology okay. issues. Ah, there you are. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Our use of Teams. Um, so yeah, I, I would. I'll start by giving a bit of a background of what Curb IQ is, and then I can jump into um, how we used it for uh, our past gig projects and how we're still using it for some current ones. So in short, Curb IQ is a solution to help uh, cities create, manage, and share curbside regulations in a visual and easy to navigate way. This came from uh, our parking and curbside team doing several different studies and noticing that cities don't have a good way to quantify what's happening at their curbside and what their inventory is. So we created Curb IQ, which consists of five modules, Curb Converter, which actually helps cities um, digitize their curbside information. We then have a visual management and analytics tool um, curve your curve manager, curve analyzer, respectively, which I'll actually show in a minute with some of the data we collected. And then lastly, a curve rules API to share, um, share this data with third parties, because ultimately it's the mobility companies, the end users, the uh, FedExes, the UPSs of the world that will want to know details about the curbside, so where they know where to load, park it, etc. So if we go to the next slide. Um, one more. Yes. So here are some of the ways uh, we we have collected data. Um, in an ideal world, cities have already have this data in some type of format. So oftentimes, and it was the same with our, our past gig project, that uh, we go into a city and they're like, we don't have sufficient curbside data, and we should look at what they do have, and we're able to piece together a pretty decent inventory. So combination of parking meter data sets, fire hydrant data sets, bike lane data sets, 
Um, anything that just relates to the curve side, we can piece that together and standardize it to, to put together that inventory. Um, and oftentimes cities aren't looking for the whole package. Having, you know, where all your permissive parking spaces are, permissive curbside spaces are, maybe enough to get started with. Um, but I, sometimes two cities want to get the entire picture of the curbside because you might be switching some of those spaces over from parking to no parking or no parking to parking, et cetera. So that's where we go out into the streets. And so this is what we did a combination of using open data and also going out in the streets to validate this data for the four different cities um, in the past gag project. So uh, we use curb level surveying, which is essentially just using open source measurement tools to survey streets, um, collect relevant curbside assets, and then we take that data in and uh, format it accordingly um, so that it can be in a digital curbside inventory. So that's everything on the supply side. With the demand side, um, there's a variety of different ways cities can collect this data. So um, starting, I guess, with the more basic, more common methods is which is parking survey data. So going out every hour, doing inventory counts to, to capture that demand. Obviously that's pretty labor intensive. Um, so there's other alternatives, which is actually installing infrastructure. So camera and sensor data. So for the Pascade project, we, a few cameras are installed to capture occupancy in real time. So obviously benefits there is that you're able to capture, um, you're able to capture real time information and with sensors, you can obviously only detect if someone's in the vehicle or not, but with a camera, you can do things like detecting license plates, type of vehicle, et cetera. And then lastly, kind of a more infrastructure free option is to use payment or spark meter data. So um, taking historical, historical transactions of when people paid for parking can give you a good picture of um, demand. Now, obviously you're gonna miss things like people overstaying or people parking illegally, but it still gives a good idea of what demand is for given areas. So that's everything on the data side of things. I'll now show what this data actually looks like once it's all formatted. So I can actually share my screen for this component. Um, pull up my screen here. I need to be, I'm currently disabled from sharing. Awesome. So what I'm sharing here is actually some of the data that was collected for uh, for a past pro or for the past gig project in Santa Monica. I also have a couple of the other cities pulled up here. Um, so obviously we started out with an empty inventory and there were a few core study areas that were um, focused on um, as well as surrounding areas. So shown there in the, in the various uh, polygons. So like I said, it was a combination of open data and actually going out into the streets. So uh, the data that was from open data I believe for Santa Monica, they actually also had curb segment data. So you know, also show Santa Monica as well, or Santa Ana as well here. But you can see some of the initial attributes collected. So or um, open data use, these are parking meters. Um, I believe we also use the bus stops, um, a few of those, uh, fire hydrants, things like that. Those were all uh, data that we already had to work with and just had to verify when we, we went out on site. Um, but then we use that open data as well as what we surveyed to actually generate a curb inventory. So if I turn on all these, you'll see the map uh, sort of fill up with color. So these are all your typical parking restrictions and then also special designations. And if I zoom in on a given area here, we can see all the different uh, designations at the curbside. And all this data was stored in a standard called uh, CDS or curb data specification, which can be used um, obviously on our platform, but it's becoming an industry standard for a lot of different companies to work with. And in addition, just being able to visualize it, it also stores all this relevant information. So um, number of spaces, uh, time limit for, for this specific 
regulation, the price, where this information is coming from. So this was actually from the parking meter data. So that's why we know it open data here. I think other segments will note, I believe if they're, uh, have you, and then you get a 24 seven breakdown of all the regulations here. What we were also able to do, um, so that's everything on the supply side. Um, but like I said, we could also pull in demand data. So this is actually our analytics dashboard that I mentioned. So this gives you a breakdown of supply um, for the given area, some interesting stats, but what I wanna focus on here is the demand. And what you can see here is uh, some of the demand that was captured for these areas. So right now we're looking at the two dates, the average of the two dates of the data collected, but we have, um, so this was the, I believe this is the survey data. We also have camera data, data stored on a different deployment. But what you're seeing here is the average hourly occupancy for these for this zone, obviously we're looking at all the different regulations right now. We go ahead and just look at um, the paid parking. Um, but that demand information is where you can get utilization, total sessions. We also have revenue. Um, and this is all just a visual platform to, to be able to see that. So this was provided to all the consultants as well as the cities, just so they can get a better idea of what type of data was collected and see the potential value in, in using this data. Maybe, I think I have one more slide in the presentation here. Um, Jess can pull it up. Awesome. So obviously with the, the, with the SCAG project, we were doing the end goal as a final report. And uh, this is where we used our platform uh, for some of this reporting as well. So I pulled out some screenshots actually from the final report that was pulled together um, to see how some of this data can be used. So some of it here you'll see is the, some of those demand stats. So average dwell time, average occupancy, et cetera. But we can also have curb space allocations to understand how much space is dedicated to parking versus loading versus curbside patios. Um, bike lanes, et cetera. Um, and I think just the real, what I kind of took away from this project is being able to, uh, being able to use all this data or be able to collect all this data is one thing, um, but oftentimes it can be kind of difficult to navigate. Uh, so that's why we created this platform so that there, you know there's tools, this platform as well as other platforms to um, actually be able to visualize this data and make use of it. Um, so you can start to detect trends, start to start to see where you can find um, value in the curbside and better allocate it for everyone. So with that, I'll pass it back to back to Jess. Perfect. Um, and to to follow up on the data element as well. Um, it's, as Jacob said, it's one thing to have data, it's another to be able to analyze and use it. But it's also important before you just go out and collect data to have a bit of a plan. So having a uh, software um, and an asset management system in place to be able to uh, understand and interpret that data, having the ability to um, basically handle the amount of data because there is quite a lot out there that could be gathered at the curb space and especially when you're first starting out not every policy is properly documented or not properly but in an easy to extract um, way and having an understanding of how the data needs to be collected from a software perspective. So I know there's, uh, Jacob, you could maybe speak to it real quick too. There's a, a data standard, I believe. Um, so having an understanding of the specification so that when you collect the data, it's you're able to immediately use it um, as opposed to spending all the money to collect it just to find out that it's not in a format that, um, the various softwares can use. Yeah, and so that's that's standard uh, 
it's called curved data specification CDS is kind of one of the more common ones emerging. And it's, it's great in two ways. In one sense, um, it's great to have a standard for a city to host all that, host all that information so that the platforms they're using or just the ways they keep that data up to date is consistent. But it's also kind of future looking is good for having third parties use that data. So for example, if FedEx wanted to know where the loading zones are in a city, but every single city they went to had a different way they were storing that information, they'd be less likely to wanna um, integrate that into their systems. However, if everyone across every city is using that same standard, that's where there starts to be more value in, in actually utilizing that data and to actually better operate at the current side. Perfect. Uh, so having presented all of the tools that were developed, um, I'm going to walk us through a case study so you can see how it was used to develop a pilot project, uh, the first one being for Santa Ana. So back to this overall flow chart, um, where do you start? Uh, and the starting point depends on where you are in your curb space management journey. So if you are just beginning and you have a whole city in front of you and you're just trying to figure out what do I do, uh, that's where you want to start at the top and you want to find the raw insights. You're going to do some stakeholder uh, engagement. You're going to find um, where the key hotspots are in the city. And you're going to also look at what the city goals are, um, what the vision for curb space management, or even just the city, if it's moving towards better safety. Um, I know vision zero is, is a hot topic in the industry. Um, if you're moving towards uh, more sustainability and placemaking, those are all elements that you need to understand so that when you define the vision and the goal for your program, um, it aligns with those other city initiatives. And then having that vision for your curb space program, having those themes and um, best practice categories, that's where you can make sure that the pilot projects that you propose align with that overall vision um, and that other partnerships, whether it's other departments um, or if you're able to tap in with parallel initiatives, if they're aligned, it makes implementation communications, it makes everything that much more smooth. Um, if that, if you're not looking to develop a fully comprehensive program and you more have a localized issue, there's certain blocks um, where maybe there's a, a land use development change or there's just been uh, safety issues or a lot of concerns and complaints, um, then you can start right at the problem statement. So you have a problem statement and you're just looking to figure out a localized solution for that area. <clears throat> And that's where you can also tap into the themes um, that SCAG has developed that were presented earlier. Uh, those are very um, common themes that are applicable for the whole SCAG region. And those can be a very good starting point if you're not looking to develop your own city specific. You can use those as the guiding principles um, and tap into those while you have your specific problem statement and essentially start from the screen arrow. Uh, so the problem statement that we looked at for Santa Ana is there is no ordinance that prohibits or allows scooter share or bike share, but the previous shared mobility pilot failed because of street clutter. So that's the specific problem statement um, that we looked at. Now, where to, uh, where was that problem seen? That's where as part of the study, we went to the community, we would talk to the city, um, to other businesses. Um, we put together a, or asked the community to put together a hotspot map and then that parametric model, which basically looked at all of the existing data sets. Uh, we didn't want to propose a pilot in an area where active infrastructure was not in place um, because then scooter share and bike share uh, has more of an impact in an area that already has that infrastructure. <clears throat> so the study area that was selected is uh, 3rd Street and Ross Street. You can see it here from a point uh, just west to a point um, at 5th. 
and you can see what the curb space designation is. So again, before you define what the solution or the pilot is going to be for the area, um, you have to understand what is the existing curb space designation? How is it used? So here we have uh, some on-street parking, the gray. We have bike lanes, two different classes, class three bike route on third street, class two on Ross street um, and some others. Within the study area, so this is a picture of the streets. You can see the bike lane, the parking. Um, there is high loading activity demand. Uh, there is on-street parking, bus stops, cycling infrastructure, um, and there's also diverse land use. So the Nova Academy is there, and it was observed that there was inadequate parking um, and loading for parents and vendors at the Academy. So the on-street parking and such, that's the inventory data. So that's the one element that is often in PDF format that Curve IQ can help you to visualize. Um, and it's the thing that tells you um, the existing designation. So the bylaws. Um, so here you can see a screenshot from Curve IQ. It also, uh, we had the site characteristics between when parking was paid versus not. Um, so you can get a sense of how it changes by time of day. And you can also see the percentage of use dedicated to either no parking, uh, loading zones, parking, et cetera. So that's the inventory. Uh, as part of the study, we then went out and collected demand data. So in Santa Ana, demand data was collected using curbside cameras and analyzed to show us what the average dwell time is for vehicles, as well as parking occupancy. Um, these are the metrics that we chose to analyze as part of this study. Um, they are not the only ones that you could analyze, um, but there's a number of uh, issues and challenges with data collection, specifically demand data collection. Uh, video is the best to capture all users, but video is time consuming and expensive to set up and analyze. So that is an element that as you go down this journey, um, there's another, I'm sure there could be another toolbox Tuesday all about the various means of data collection. Um, so for this study, these are the two metrics that we looked at and uh, I'll have key findings on the next slide, but you can already see here um, that the parking occupancy and the parking zones are very heavily utilized. So the key findings from our data collection is that illegal PUDO activity was observed. Um, and most times that curbside activity took place, both the bike lane and pedestrian activity was encroached upon. Um, a method that organizes the clutter of activity along the curbside while furthering the city's goals related to the curb transportation and sustainability could be an optimal solution for this area. Um, it does primarily facilitate movement for employees and access for people entering the workplace. Um, and this is evident in the frequency of illegal PUDO activity happening. Um, and then the, uh, the encroachment on the bike lane and, and pedestrian activity is especially prominent given um, the extensive active transportation uh, infrastructure. So that brings us to the curb typology. Um, so we, we have our problem statement. From our problem statement, we found our existing conditions, so our inventory data. Um, we use that plus stakeholder inputs to identify what the study area should be. Um, from there, we collected specific data. Um, so that's the demand data to make basically validate the problem statement. Um, sometimes you may think that there's a problem, and then when you collect data, you may find that the problem statement is um, the the data may show that there's a, a different problem statement and you need, may need to go back and tweak it. Um, in this case, the data supported the problem statement that we found. Um, then we look at the typology. So looking at the land use, we looked at what do we want this area to be? How do we want the corridor to operate? And based on land use and the usage, um, the desired typology was identified as employee access. So employee access promotes employee access to office space or government buildings. It may be located near off street parking um, and the functions prioritize movement, access for people, then deliveries, parking and placemaking. 
So then you can look at, do the current curbside designations align with the corridor type? The designations are primarily no stopping uh, with bike lanes, so that supports the movement. Um, however, high volume of illegal activity is present, which suggests that the usage does not align. Um, it suggests that access for people definitely is needed in this area, but the designations do not allow for the amount that is in demand. So then we look at our menu of options. We have here our problem statement. Um, based on the problem statement, the best practice area best handled to address it is policy. And the recommended category is alternative micromobility permitting. Um, so that's the, our suggested um, solution. So then from the menu of options, there's two different options. One is single vendor concession and the other is private property shared mobility. So that brings us, essentially this table brings us to our, our proposed pilot project right away. Um, the specific pilot that we recommended is to reevaluate alternative permitting methods to micromobility. So this includes the evaluation of single vendor concession um, with more rigorous service level agreements related to utilization, integration with transit and enforcement mechanisms. Um, and that is that first um, single vendor concession option. They also paired it with private property shared mobility so as part of that, um, it's proposed to evaluate private property docked micromobility options that would link major transportation hubs to sites such as employers and retailers. This would allow the docks to be installed on private property so that micromobility can only be dropped off at a dock, which uh, mitigates some of the, the key concerns often associated with micromobility, and it helps prevent that clutter at the street. It helps... Um, alleviate some of the uh, pick up and drop off activity by giving an alternative means to access those land use. Uh, so that is um, the first case study that we uh, went through. Um, in the nature of time, we do have a second one, um, but maybe first I'll open it up and see if there's, um, seeing that there's only 15 minutes left, um, if there's any questions um at this time and i'm not sure if it's easier to post it in the chat uh so maybe what i could do is i can run through um the next case study real quick and you can have a think if you have questions that you want to bring up um and if you want to either post it in the chat or um, I believe in, in Zoom, you can raise a hand, um, but uh, I'll go through the next one while you have a think if there's any questions. Okay, so <clears throat> the second case study uh, was in the city of Riverside. <clears throat> so the study, uh, I forgot to put in what the problem statement was. I have it in a later slide. Uh, let me quickly. Okay, so the problem statement, uh, apologies for that, is that major congestion was caused by multiple modes competing for curb space. So delivery, TNC, transit, parking, etc. cetera. Uh, so we identified a study area through the same means, stakeholder input using our inventory data and the study area identified was University Ave between Market Street and Lime Street. So this is a little bit longer and you can see how the study area and the corridor type doesn't have to be a specific linear segment. Um, as we saw in the Santa Ana example, it could be a bend, it could be along multiple streets, um, it could be a two block or even a one block, or it could be much longer. Um, it all depends on the type of project and the land use. So along here, there is again, bike lanes, um, as well as some on-street parking and some loading zones. So quite the diverse uh, use. So high loading area uh, 
that compete for on-street parking and loading. Um, there's nine bus lines and there is access points for service vehicles. So this is in the heart of downtown, I believe. Um, it's a heavily commercialized area with a lot of different um, curbside users all coming together to access the same land use. The inventory data, again, even compared with the Santa Ana example, you can see that there's uh, some more land use. Um, we now have bus stops as part of it, as well as parking zones and driveways. Um, and then for curb IQ, one element that I forgot to mention is there's a focus. So the yellow here is the corridor, as we defined it, our study area. But you don't want to look at those designations in isolation. There are some studies where having an understanding of adjacent land use is important as well. Sorry, ad, um, uh, curbside designations along parallel streets. So if a use needs to be shifted from one street to another, uh, understanding what the adjacent streets have and whether um, a usage could be pushed to that next street, what the block radius is, um, it can all help, for instance, if this is where we have a lot of key users, but then you have a lot of um, parking on side streets, then it's an easier, it's an easier sell and it's part of being transparent in that trade off between curb space users that the public um, and other stakeholders can understand that you're not removing parking, you are providing curb space use for XYZ user and parking as a user drivers are still accommodated within a reasonable distance, um, just not right in front. Uh, and I mentioned parking not to harp on parking, but just because it's the easiest concept for most people to understand when it comes to trade-offs at the curb. In the demand data, uh, so in Riverside, we collected data using dash cam footage. Um, so we basically had drivers drive the corridor um, at regular intervals and then uh, analyzed it uh, afterwards. Um, and here again, you can see that there is fairly high parking occupancy throughout the day as well as the weekend. Key data findings um, are that the occupancy rates were relatively consistent. Um, and there was, again, a lot of illegal curbside activity um, observed where vehicles were parked in no parking zones for 25 minutes at a time. Um, on the weekends, they were there for 40 minutes at a time, if not more. And generally speaking, you want occupancy to be about 80 to 85%. That means that there's always a space for drivers to pull in and park without needing to cruise um, or make sudden movements, um, which can, you know, reduce safety um, and uh, whatnot at the curb. Um, and the high occupancy percentage and uh, percentage of illegal activity indicates an opportunity to consider either increasing parking fees, looking at a progressive parking payment system, um, payment being, again, a very useful and effective way of managing the curb by encouraging certain behaviors. Looking at the typology, uh, this one is a mixed use main street. So the function here we can see is different from the previous case study. We have access for people as the number one function and then placemaking as well. Um, and this highlights that the function doesn't have to be um, necessarily hierarchical. You can have multiple priorities. Obviously, you don't want all five to be a priority, and having the hierarchy doesn't mean that parking is not important at all. It just means that for the limited space, if you have to look at a trade-off, this is the preferred priority for that trade-off. So access for people and placemaking as the top two. And the current designations uh, do not align with this corridor type, which is a clear uh, support for a pilot project here to change that. Uh, so the designations do favor drivers. There is a lot of on-street parking provided, both paid and free. And we can see that having wow. that percentage of curb space dedicated to parking does not align since we want it to be mostly for placemaking and access for people. Coming to our menu of options, 
we have our problem statement and this one has a number of different uh, recommendations. Um, you don't necessarily want to go for all of them and that's not what this tool is intended. What it's intended to do is give um, the best practice area. So if you want to focus on data, if you want to focus on cost or policy um, within there, you can then narrow it down to which options are uh, your best starting point. For Riverside, um, we opted to do this top one, which was focusing on data, new and changing uses and technology. So the recommended pilot is computer vision cameras and LIDAR. So using those tools to better understand curb congestion through data. And what this also emphasizes is that not every um, menu, uh, option from the menu of options is going to immediately fix the issue. Sometimes what it does is uh, allows you to better understand what's going on at the curb so that the solutions that you recommend later are more effective and more targeted. So for this one, it's to utilize low cost data collection methods to collect curbside data along the entire corridor and then to use this data to better understand things like the total number of parking, the duration of parking, um, so you can develop effective time limit regulations, implementation guidance, um, and you can also determine the number of zones. Once you have that data, you can then go back to your menu of options and having that additional information, you can now look at various things like policy demand, maybe you need to have some flex zones, or maybe based on that, you think that uh, pricing short-term parking could be more effective and you have the data to support that second pilot. Uh, so that's everything from my end. Um, there's still a few minutes. I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but I will open it back up um, and as well as pass it over to Prithvi if there's any final words that you wanted to say. Thank you, Jessica. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation and run through. Um, SCAG is generally deeply interested in understanding and resolving curb challenges in the region. Um, in my business unit, Goods Movement, it started with the last mile freight delivery study, uh, which was a mostly freight focused and then led to this curb space management study uh, to take a more comprehensive look at the curb. Uh, these efforts have um, they have allowed us to further collaborate and coordinate uh, with various cities throughout the region uh, and across different programs, uh, including the Call 3 of Sustainable Communities program, as well as Last Mile Freight program. So we are looking forward to continuing uh, to serve our member cities and their curb management interests. Uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to us if you want to know more about this study or any other ongoing efforts. Uh, I can drop my email address in the chat box. Uh, it is theore at skag.ca.gov, D-E-O-R-E. -E. Um, the link to the study is on the screen um, as well as it's in the chat box. Um, yeah, and if we don't have any questions um, right now, um, I just want to thank you all for joining. Um, please yeah, feel free to reach out over uh, to us over email. Um, we can stay along um, for a couple more minutes uh, if there are more questions. If not, um, I'm happy that we all could join in and learn more.